Um, I love teaching at the Fung Institute. I love working with uh, engineering leaders or in people working towards being engineering leaders. And I think this program is very unique um, because there is a big focus on leadership. And part of being a leader is participation and sort of communication skills. And so whenever I teach, I try to make sure that um, the students are participating. So I'm gonna share my screen so you can see my slides. And let's see, can everybody see my slides? Yes, thank you so much, Alan. I appreciate you um, showing me your thumbs up. Um, so during this part, I'm going to kind of try to open up the screen here so I can see you all better. Uh, okay, so I am going to start out um, with a little exercise. I'd like to just get you all participating. So as I said, this is a demo course. The course that I teach in the winter uh, boot camp is called Tech Strategy at the Convergence of Business, Technology, and Intellectual Property. And I will go into some of those details. But before we get started, I like to get people talking a little bit and hear from you all. So um, I'm going to just quickly on the agenda side, I'm going to give a little intro and background, which I'm doing now. Then I'm going to talk about intellectual property as a competitive intelligence piece, uh, do a little case study. And then finally, if there's time, I'll get to intellectual property as a control position. And the reason I'm focusing on intellectual property is because you all having engineering backgrounds have likely had lots of um, courses and, and um, um, experience working on engineering topics and R&D topics. I think business topics are much easier to come by. More people talk about them and they're more sort of embedded in some of these undergrad programs that you're coming from. But on the intellectual property side, it turns out that most engineers coming out of undergrad school don't have a good sense of that piece of it and how it fits together with the technology and R&D side and with the business side. And so that's an area where I have strength. I tend to focus on that because my overall theory is that engineering leaders should be well-versed in business, in technology and intellectual property. And in order to be a leader, you kind of need to understand how those pieces fit together. So, um, yeah, I'm gonna get started in a minute, but before I do, I wanna hear from you all, um, if you're willing to participate, on what your idea of a tech strategy is. So would somebody brave and courageous be willing to kick us off? You can raise your mechanical hand, or you can raise your regular hand, whichever you prefer. I'd love to hear thoughts. There's no wrong answers here. Anybody can give me an idea? Go ahead, Alana, I appreciate you stepping up, thank you. Um, so I'm just thinking from like past internships, probably like releasing a product when the market's right for that. So like releasing like a certain thing that, you know, would get sold, but then maybe holding off on other things. So you kind of stagger your releases. Okay. So timing of how you release products. Yeah. Uh, all right. Who else? Anybody else have any ideas? Don't be afraid. Go Hi. ahead, John. Yeah, please. Um, I would think of a technology strategy as something that leads a customer towards a new capacity, mm -hmm. a new ability that they did not have before that then builds a sustainable profit mechanism for the creator of that capacity. Okay, very good, very interesting. I like that perspective, more of a business perspective. Um, who else? Anybody else have any other ideas? What does tech strategy mean to you? What does technology strategy mean? Um, <clears throat> maybe uh, trying to develop like vertical integration between yeah. your technology. Yeah, very good. What do you mean by vertical integration? Um, like having products and services dependent on one another such mm -hmm. that uh, your technology is robust and abundant in the way that it can help a consumer. Okay, excellent. Very good. Who else? What about think internally? What's the tech strategy internally for a company like 
Microsoft or Google, how do they think about tech strategy? Anyone have an idea? They want to share? Like I said, there's no right answers. I just want to hear people stepping up and talking a little bit. Okay, so I'm not sure if it has something to do with this, but I yeah. think it can be like the strategy you follow to decide on what technology are you going to invest on which technology you want to develop. Yeah, very good. Um, I'll say build from scratch versus purchase. Does that make sense, Andres? Yeah? Okay. Yeah, it's good enough. Thank okay. you. Anybody else have anything to add? You're doing great. Go ahead. Uh, is it Ivan? Um, yeah, I would also think that uh, any, especially not startup company, would uh, have multiple technologies, but they still have to focus on uh, something that does pay for everything else. For example, like, uh, you know, Amazon, they have sort of like two core businesses, one which is not making money, but did spread the word about uh, uh, service and everyone uses it, and another one that makes a lot of money um the cloud service but not many people only the people in tech do know about that service but still um uh, they have to prioritize they have many other businesses but it's uh most of them are just losing money so they have to focus on something yeah so it's a way to build on each other right you have one product stream that's not profitable but everyone knows about it another one that's very profitable and so you use those Together, very good. Um, anybody else have anything they want to add? You don't have to show your face to talk. Go ahead, John. Um, it can also be clearly more ominous than than all of these optimistic viewpoints. It can okay. be used for control, domination, coercion okay. within a company or a country or some form of politic. Right. Do those have to be evil things, John? Not necessarily. Okay. Can Although you... we have a lot of evidence that it is being used that way recently, especially on the country level. Can you think of a way that it's used where it's not evil or negative, or can anybody? Um, it can be used to evaluate and, and analyze future possibilities. Um, it could be used to profit share accurately huh? among participants within projects. Uh, that's one way I like to think of technology within a company is to figure out who is creating the profit and how okay. to pay them fairly mm -hmm. and equi with equanimity. equanimity. Yeah. I think there's a lot of opportunity there for tech within companies to better pay people for their input. Okay, very good. And uh, Alana added an example of vaccination development. I like that, Alana. All right, very good. Thank you everyone who participated. For those of you who didn't, it's totally fine, totally normal, but one thing that you need to learn that you'll understand about this engineering leadership program is that participation is really important, especially in my class. Maybe other professors don't um, hold that at such a high level, but my belief is that if you're gonna be an engineering leader, and that means you're, in my view, you're either gonna work at a startup or you're gonna work at a consulting firm or you're gonna work at a big company, could be nonprofit or for-profit, being able to communicate uh, with other colleagues, being able to lead to show those leadership skills, you really do need to communicate. And communication goes two ways, it goes, you telling people what you think and you listening to what other people think. And so in my classes, we focus a lot on this idea of trying to build those skills because not everybody have those skills and everyone's sort of at a different level. So some people in a class will sort of lead and help the others get involved. And in other cases, it'll go the other way. So just something that I wanna make sure that people are prepared for. Okay, I'm gonna talk a little bit now about this larger topic. Um, I mentioned this idea of the intersection of business, of technology, business, and intellectual property. And so I take a unique approach to this idea of tech strategy, and it starts at this sort of intersection, okay? So you have 
technology issues. What is the product we're developing? How are we developing? What technology are we using to get it, to develop it? Um, who else is developing similar technology? Okay. And how are we evaluating what we're doing compared to what they're doing? And then you have the business side, which is sort of commingled with the technology side. Again, who else is selling products like this? What are the products that we're trying to sell? What technologies do we need in order to sell those products? Which technologies do we have? Which uh, uh, ones that don't we have that we might either need to build from scratch or buy off the shelf? And then the final layer is this intellectual property piece, which we refer to as control. And this idea that I'm gonna go through now is that in order to have the technology dialed in and understand what technology you have access to, um, it helps to understand where the control position lays. So do you, if you need to, um, let's say you identify some other piece of a, a component of a technology you're developing, but you don't have control over it, how do you get that control? Because without it, it's very difficult to go to market and commercialize. With it, you may have a very different structure than you had originally. So we'll go through that a little bit more. And then similarly on the business side, um, intellectual property and these control positions will drive your business positioning. So we're trying to think about the world from these three different perspectives. So this foundation, in my opinion, of a solid uh, technology strategy sort of revolves around having technology, okay, assets, business assets and business um, acumen and then control. And if you're, if you, have assets that are sitting in, in between these three things, you're in a very strong position to win in a market. Does that make sense so far? Anybody have any questions? Go ahead, Ivan. Uh, by assets, do you mean uh, physical assets or people as asset or technology? With, like, uh... Great question. So all of those are assets, right? And some of those assets are intellectual assets, like ideas and thoughts and knowledge that people have. And some of those may be more um, hard assets, like specific um, devices or machines to do experiments on, or they could be business assets, contacts, um, supply chain issues. Who, who are we getting our, our products from? Who are we getting these components from? Can anybody else get components from them? If, if people knew that we're getting our components from XYZ supplier, could they then go and get the same components? Or do we have some kind of most favored nation clause, a way to get those components at a better rate than anybody else can. That's how control fits into it. So again, you have these business issues. We got to get these products, these components to build our product, right? And to sell those products to the market. But we can't do that unless we have some level of control without having the ability to stop others. And we'll get into that uh, a little bit later. Anybody else have a question at this point? All right, is anybody totally lost? Raise your hand if you're totally lost. It's okay if you are, I just wanna see. All right, at least to the people who I can see, you're, you're with me, thank you. Okay, so again, within this kind of um, connective area, we see the role of technology. And as I mentioned, you're talking about the technology itself, thinking about um, analyzing the technology landscape, right, who else has technology? Is there a better way to accomplish what we're trying to accomplish with different technology? Okay, what technology do we control? That's this overlap of control. And what, how does the technology impact our commercialization plan? Is it gonna be very expensive to produce this product, therefore we need to raise the price? Or do we have components that allow us to do it much cheaper, much less expensively than others so we can lower the price? Okay, again, I'm trying to get you to think about this as one whole big thing altogether as opposed to these separate siloed issues, which is a lot of times how large corporations and startups think about things, okay? The next piece is this commercialization piece. And again, it builds on the other two areas. So we're gonna sell a product. And again, what's the cost that we're selling it at? How does that rely on our technology? Are we gonna win on technology? Maybe we don't have the best technology, but we sure do have great contacts and great suppliers. And we have this amazing network that we can keep others out of we can control that piece of it, okay? So how are we gonna win in the business, on the business side? And then finally the control side, which sort of overlaps with everything, right? If you don't have a way, a moat, we'll call it, around a castle, for example, to keep people out or some way to slow people down, it's very difficult to win in the market, okay? We see this a lot in software as a service type models where maybe the moat is being the first one there or maybe the moat is having a really strong brand name 
or distribution network. Um, or maybe the moat in a hard technology area is that, oh, we have this know-how, these trade secrets or these patents that we can keep other people out. Is that all making sense? All right, I'm gonna keep moving forward. Yep, go ahead, Ivan, please. How would you describe, um, I have this example that uh, I would like you to give your opinion on. So the 3D printing technology has been held for the time of the patent. And uh, if we had that technology 20 years ago, or you know, 20 years without the patent just holding people back, um, would you say that for humanity it would be better in these type of cases, but commercially it's not viable and some patents should be overturned because of the how feasible, how impactful they can be? Right. It's a great question. There's not a, a direct answer. I can't say, oh, this is how it should be and this isn't. Some of these questions border on ethics, right? So Alana earlier brought up vaccines. Okay, do you remember during COVID, there was this big discussion about all of the big pharma companies that spent hundreds of millions, billions of dollars developing these um, vaccines should just open up the patents and let anybody use them from any country, okay? And there's an ethical reason to do that, right? You're talking about people getting sick. They figured out how to develop this technology here in the US or in the West, in, in Europe. And therefore, they should share that knowledge with other people, right? And so from the perspective of the company themselves, they're like, look, we invested hundreds of millions, billions of dollars into developing these technologies, and we developed them. So therefore, we believe that we should get a profit, right? So they sort of, they're the haves. They have the technology. Then you have everybody else who's the sort of have-nots that are outside of that bubble who are sitting there saying, look, great, you developed this, but we're in a hum human crisis. Uh, uh, there's this virus is going around that can kill people, people are dying, you have an obligation to spread that. Now, one of the interesting questions comes to the technology side. So let's just say that Pfizer or, Mo or Moderna or AstraZeneca would have given the patents to the rest of the world. They said, here, for countries in Africa, you can use this and we won't charge you a license fee. And for countries in Asia, we're going to give this to you, not charge a license fee. And for South America and all the other countries of the world, we're going to give you this patent. And we're not going to charge you a license fee. So go ahead and make these vaccines. Okay, how many of these countries have the physical um, equipment, have the know-how to actually use these patents and manufacture these vaccines? Right? So it's not always just about patents. It's not always just about control from that perspective. It's also about know-how. And it's also about the manufacturing equipment and the, the right temperature that these vaccines need to be created at and the machines and the rooms and all of the things that go into it that get lost in the kind of public media discussion of it. But that's really what we're talking about here, this overlay of technology. You need this technology just because you have control. It's great, you showed me how to do it, but I can't do it without the technology. And then you have these business relationships. It needs to be done in a regulated way. It needs to be done in a safe way. You can't just have some you know, people that haven't done this before developing vaccines and all of a sudden they're distributing these. What if they're not safe? What, what's the regulatory environment? So all these things kind of work together to you know make the whole situation very muddy. So in the case of a 3D printer, it depends on so many different factors. And I think if we went around the, the um, group, which we would do in a real class setting, people may have different opinions about what's right or what's wrong. Or So what, part of what I'm trying to expose you to and the um, Masters of Engineering program, to be an engineering leader, you need to be able to hear different perspectives, right? During these classes, I want you, Ivan, to come in with a mindset of like, this is what I think. And then you listen to your colleagues and they tell you other things. You're like, oh, now I kind of think this is the way forward. Good leaders, good leadership is they are able to listen and really change and adjust their mind. It doesn't mean one person's right or one person's wrong. It's just having that openness to be able to absorb other information and then have that sort of help you move forward into being a better leader. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, thank you. The okay. vaccine example was actually brilliant because yes, it, uh, it does outline like ethically, we should have had the patents you know, just distributed, but then you know, again, technology and uh, control uh, of uh, uh, you know how safely it will be distributed. 
Yeah, and again, I appreciate, I appreciate your opinion. Well, I've talked this through many times, so it's not like I just made it up. But other people in the class may be of the opinion, ethically, you have no obligation to do this. You spent hundreds of millions of dollars to develop these. So if people want access to them, they should have to pay you. You're not getting reimbursed. The government should have to pay you if they want to access it. And I'm not taking a side here. I'm just saying you need to keep an open mind and hear those different perspectives. Okay? But then but then again, uh, no, the, this conversation wasn't even being held uh, in terms of like funding these patents or like, you know, reimbursing. It was just, you know, we will distribute it with the funds from like somebody else, but we will hold the technology or hold the patent. Right. It was never a public discussion of releasing them. I mean, it was a public discussion, but never uh, was held by, by the companies. Right, but I just wanna make sure you're understanding those different perspectives. John, did you have something to add? Well, yes, in this example, it's interesting because of how many government subsidize, subsidies created the ability for these companies to Right. generate these mechanisms that then they ended up having total control over. So again, to the point of profit sharing, we have this odd mix of socialism and capitalism where socialism builds a capitalistic mechanism that then is total control by a private enterprise and the profit doesn't end up coming back to the people who funded the expertise. So it's really a funny. Yeah. Mixture here ethically and, and and technically, I'm curious maybe on your perspective on that without going too down too far down the rabbit hole, of course. Yeah. No, it's an excellent point. And I mean, I could make an argument, I'm not going to, but I just will throw this out there that you could argue that the benefit to society in the US, the, the taxpayers that paid the bill for this is getting access to the vaccine. So again, just trying to play that sort of other side of the argument, okay? And my goal is to help train you all to, to think that way and to sort of keep your minds open. Okay, again, when you think of a technology leader, who, who comes to your mind? Who, who can tell me someone they think is a great leader? Forget about technology, just who's a great leader in your opinion? Steve Jobs. Okay, and why is Steve Jobs a great leader? He took charge against yep. social and even intimate pressure against a new movement, a new direction, a new mechanism, a new capacity that was contradictory to other motivations and trends. Okay, great. And so can anyone give me a counter argument why Steve Jobs wasn't a great leader? If not, that's okay. I can make one up. Uh, he was uh, just making people basically almost fight physically for for their survival. Like if you deliver, then you, your team is good. If you don't, you kind of like lose your job, which is and he he was by many books and people a dick. <laughs> so. Yeah, so people have written about he was not a very nice person. He didn't he didn't build a lot of um, sort of. Um, kindness into his leadership role, okay? And now more than back in the 80s, kindness is really, really important. Not that it wasn't important then, but now it's in this country, at least it's a very, a big focus of trying to get um, consensus and trying to build a team and trying to get the most out of a team, okay? So there's this there difference. There are two teams that are gonna have more friction. Sorry, go ahead. Can you say that again? I, I couldn't hear you. Rahul, did you have something to add? Okay, I'm gonna keep moving forward. If you have something to add, raise your hand and um, I'm happy to discuss it. Okay, so gotta keep moving here. Wanna just go through. Okay, so this is um, sort of the framework that I use and a lot of these slides I'll keep coming back to in different contexts. So we'll be talking about technology one day. I'll bring this slide up. We'll be talking about control. I'll bring this slide up. We'll be talking about business. I'll bring this slide up. So all these things kind of work together. So the first question that we have to answer when we're trying to understand the tech strategy in this case that I'm describing is what, what do we control? What are the things that we control? We have to capture those things. So they may be in patents. They may be in trade secrets. They may be in lists of customers. They may be in data. They could be in all kinds of different things. 
And then how do those things give us a competitive advantage? And then the second piece is like, what is our position, right? Related to everybody else. So we control these things. Who else controls similar things? Or how do our things relate to the things they control? And so this is about what is our position? So we have capture and we have positioning. And then that leads to sort of identifying value opportunities. Well, now that we've discovered what everybody else controls and, and where our position is, now we got to think about how we're going to commercialize this. How can our technology generate value in light of all these other organizations or people or whatever it is based on what they control technically or they control it from a business perspective or they control from an intellectual property perspective? And then finally, by understanding sort of the commercialization piece, we get to this R&D gap. Now we understand what can be commercialized, but we're also seeing, hey, there's things that we're trying to solve for people, problems that, there ha that haven't been solved. And so this is this gap. We go back to how do we capture that? How do we get access to that to be able to move our idea forward? So this is a matrix. Again, it's a theoretical model and that's all it is, but it sort of supports this whole idea of the, the business, the technology and the, and the IP or the control working together, okay? So I'm gonna keep reinforcing this point. Um, so from an IP perspective itself, and again, I'm, I'm pushing this out there as the thing that you're likely to have the least exposure to, we wanna think IP as a portfolio of possibilities to facilitate growth um, and to pivot. So startups talk about pivoting, okay? Business development managers or, or corporate um, R&D managers talk about pivoting. Hey, we, we've done this, we created this technology, we have to move to a different market because this one, it's not a good fit. We don't have a good product market fit. And so what this portfolio possibility does is it gives you the ability to protect and use some underlying technology, but move into different commercialization areas, different markets. So you may have a technology that you've developed that works for, for solution X or for product X, but you end up, because you've filed IP or you've protected this in a certain way that you can actually move it to do something else in a different market. And I'll go through an example of that when I do this case study. Um, IP, uh, as a, as a uh, to control key knowledge required. So intellectual property, we're thinking about this in a way of like, how am I controlling the key knowledge? It could be in patents, it could be in trademarks, it could be in trade secrets, it could be in branding, it could be first to market, okay? As you start to scale a business up, you start to move from the sort of shallow end of the pool to the deep end of the pool. And the big players are thinking about this, okay? They're thinking long and hard about this. They spend a lot of resources trying to figure out how they're gonna maintain control or how they're gonna stop you from gaining control. And then the final piece is using IP as a bargaining chip. So if you're starting up a company or you're developing a product at a corporate lab, IP, and again, this doesn't just mean patents and trademarks and trade secrets, it means knowledge. It means um, connections and contacts and all the different intangible things. This is what gives you this ability to have leverage when you try to enter a market, okay? Because you go to that market and they say, well, what are you bringing to the table? And you say, well, I have all these patents. And they say, well, we've read all your patents and we can do exactly what you're doing. What do you bring beyond that? Oh, well, we have a partnership with um, Greenpeace or we have a partnership with Walmart or we have a partnership with Google. Oh, okay. Well, that's an intangible connection, contact asset that you have that gives you leverage in a particular area. Okay. So I'm going to talk about IP as competitive intelligence. This is something that many of you probably don't know a lot about. So I'm just going to take you through it pretty quickly. And, you know, if you end up coming through the MNG program and you take my course, we'll go through this in greater depth. Any questions before I dig into this? Super quickly, I, yeah. your comments... Your just your comments just there made me think about mergers and acquisitions. Coming from a background of emergent tech M and A, okay. you can acquire and capture control. That's and right. We seem to have been implying that all of this is coming from internal, but yep. I'm sure that in that matrix between tech, between business and control, is the ability to acquire absolutely or, and or attack. Yep. Very good. So somebody brought this build versus buy up. Do we build it from scratch or do we buy it off the shelf? How do we get access to this tech that we don't already have? Obviously it's more um, um, relevant to larger companies that have the resources to acquire, but two small companies 
could get into some partnership relationship or collaboration, right? This happens with university tech transfer departments and startups all the time and big companies. So there's lots of different ways to attain the technology. Yes, mergers and acquisitions, excellent point. Okay, there's lots of ways to get these assets. Um, okay, I'm gonna keep moving. Oh, go ahead, John, quickly. Thank you for your comment. Yes, I'm, I'm especially interested in that tech transfer from within academia. That that seems to be a burgeoning sector right now. And I'm curious about your perspectives on that in the future. Yeah, happy to chat with you. And by the way, anybody's welcome to reach out on LinkedIn or send me an email um, and connect. I'm happy to connect with all of you and discuss and interact. So I'm very um, open to communication. So. Um, I'm going to keep moving for now, though, and we'll get to that uh, at another point. Okay, so I'm going to talk about this case study for this company called Connor Med Systems. Um, Connor Med Systems created a bi-directional drug eluding stent. Does anybody know what a stent is? Anybody heard about a stent? Okay, so a stent. Uh, uh, a drug eluding stent in this case is a small scaffolding, okay, that goes inside of your blood vessel. If you have a plaque, right, and you need to open up that pathway, they use a stent to, they essentially insert a stent on a catheter. So they put this like little line up into your artery, and then they take this little metal piece and they have a balloon that blows up inside of the metal piece and it sticks to your blood vessel walls, and then they pull the line out, and that stent stays in there and it keeps the blood flowing. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's what a stent is. So these folks created this bi-directional drug eluding stent, and a drug eluding stent is one in which you can put drugs into this side of the stent wall so that it goes into the blood vessel, and then you can put a different drug into the other side of the hole in the stent that goes into the blood vessel into the lumen. So you have the ability to deliver two different drugs, one into the vessel wall and one into the bloodstream, okay? And they developed this back in the early uh, or the 1990s and it was a very unique design and something different. Um, this is their key early patent. They talk about this drug delivery device and method for bi-directional drug delivery it was filed in 2003. And in my course, I will go through all the prerequisites to learn how to read a patent and understand what's there and why it's important. Um, so in the process of developing this, they had lots of business and technology questions. So again, I'm talking about patents and IP, but I'm talking about business and technology in the same breath. Okay, so some of the questions they would have just as a business, who else is working? Who are the other competitors working on this tech, right? What drugs are they delivering in their stent? And for what indications, okay? Are they delivering stuff for plaque? Or are they delivering stuff for other issues? What are the materials and the designs they're using? All right, how are they designing their stent? What materials? Um, where will they manufacture and sell this? Are they just gonna sell in the US? Are they gonna sell in China? Are they gonna sell it in Botswana? Are they gonna sell it in Chile? Okay. Um, and where are they gonna manufacture? They may say, we're only selling in the US, but we're gonna manufacture it in Indonesia, okay? So you need to think about all these things because this is part of the question about what technology is there, what are the commercialization opportunities and how do we control it? So if they decide they're gonna manufacture it in Indonesia, you gotta figure out a way to stop people from manufacturing in, in other places, okay? And then how are they manufacturing their products? What techniques, what are the steps they're using to manufacture? And then are other competitors developing this technology in-house or are they licensing it from others? And so these are important questions. And what I'm here to show you is how you can answer these questions, excuse me, using patent information, okay? So these patents that I'm gonna show you and this, this process, this is all based on publicly available data. So what we did is we, we found a, a firm that's not my firm, it's another firm, they're located in India, and they created a coronary stent patent landscape. There's a picture of how big a stent is just to give you a sense of the size of it. And you can see there's one here that looks like it's made of some kind of metal and another one that's made of some plastic or other type of synthetic material. 
Uh, and here's a picture of the balloon and the wire I mentioned inside of the stent. So this balloon blows up, the stent is very flexible, goes into the walls of the artery, and then that line and the balloon pull, pull, are pulled out. So this patent landscape project that this company Patent Insight Pro did, and this is all uh, available on the internet, I'm happy to send you a copy. So they start out and they have to search the patent literature. Okay, you might have heard of Google patents. There's the European Patent Office site. There's different places to search to find who else is filing patents in this area. Now, I'm going to show you how they do that. They create these search terms, coronary, coronary or drug within two words of eluding um, uh, or artery and the word stent in the title abstract and claims and these class codes. So these are all details about patents that I'm not going to go into now, but if you take my course, you'll learn all about it. Okay. And this is a pretty interesting and unique way to identify competitive technology information that most engineers don't know how to do. And most patent attorneys are not prepared. They don't have the commensurate background to be able to do this. Okay. So um, here are some of the things that you can get from doing this analysis. By the way, they did this search and they came up with about 4,100 unique patent families, okay, related to coronary stents. And this research is pretty old. It goes back, I think it ended in 2010. So the first thing they did is develop this IP activity or publication trend, the velocity of activity over time. And you can see going back to 1986, these are the patents that were published all over the world with these different families that they identified. And you can see how it was ramping up and then it started to ramp down in 2010. And that's related to an anomaly in the time between filing a patent and when it publishes. So there's an 18 month window there. And so the, the data ends in 2010. Um, that's probably when they published a the report, but there were several more patents that published that year because you wouldn't find out about them till 18 months after. Okay, so that's one thing that you can just see. How much activity is happening over time? Is it growing? Is it shrinking? Is it stable? What's the, what's the land, the uh, velocity look like? Okay, another thing is you can learn from patent information, who are the companies? So in this case, they looked at the top companies that are uh, have patents assigned to them. You can see Abbott Labs and Biotronic and Boston Scientific, and you can see over time. So Boston Scientific has been ramping things up, okay? Here's another, example where they look at family coverage okay here are the jurisdictions us europe the patent cooperation treaty japan germany china australia great britain korea and then by company how much how much how many patents have been filed in these different jurisdictions okay i just want to reinforce and say this all of this information is publicly available okay all of this every single thing that i'm putting on these slides you can find searching the internet Okay, so this is an immense amount of information and we can even go deeper. So here they went into coding technologies. What are the coding technologies? Okay, here endothelial cells, inorganic carbon, inorganic gold, inorganic indium oxide, inorganic silicon carbide, porous materials, and they're showing by company how many patents they have related to each of these. So you can see Boston Scientific only has nine patents related to inorganic carbon. Johnson & Johnson has 24 and Biotronic has zero, okay? And then here's another one, material type. What is, what is the material that they're using? These people are using a bare metal cobalt chromium alloy stent. Um, some people are using magnesium alloy, titanium alloy, platinum indium alloy, pure iron, okay? And then showing by companies, you can see which companies are investing dollars into which of these technology areas. Now, it's possible that they're investing just to throw competitors off, right? Big companies like Abbott Labs and Boston Scientific uh, and Johnson & Johnson, they can, they can afford to file patents in different areas just to throw the competitors off, and they do that. Whereas small companies like Extent, they don't have as big of a budget. So when you see that they're you know, filing in these areas and mostly in titanium alloy bare metal stents and a little bit in or the next is stainless steel, that's probably where they're focusing their R&D dollars. Okay, each one of the patent families in these that are represented by these numbers, you're talking about 20, 30, 50, $100,000 worth of expenditures to do the research and file the patent applications and go through the process with the government offices. 
Okay, so you get a real sense of where they're investing. Here's another one, application areas, um, different ar arteries in the abdomen, arteries in the chest, arteries in the kidney, arteries in the thigh, um, carotid arteries. You can see where they're investing, which company's investing where. And then this one is application areas by material. So for you know, nickel titanium alloy um, is really uh, focused on these arteries in the chest. So if you're approaching the chest, if you're doing a startup or you're doing a big company, you wanna start a company or start a project in this area and you're thinking about using nickel titanium alloy or more importantly, you're thinking about attacking arteries in the chest, you're probably gonna be looking closely at this material. So the technical people need this information, right? To figure out what should we do? How are we gonna do this? And as John said, do we buy this off the shelf or do we um, you know, uh, build it from scratch? And look, there's all this information. Remember, every one of these patents is 10, 50, 100 pages of technical information that's describing how these companies are doing this thing. The deal is when you file a patent, you have to disclose how to do it. You have to enable it. You have to tell other people skilled in this technology area, here's how you create this technology. Once you do that and it's public, then anybody else in that area can read it, okay? So this information is extremely valuable. Then also from a business perspective, well, I wanna know what my competitors are doing. Well, look, you know, Abbott Labs, they're spending most of their time on arterial uh, restenosis or rethrombosis. And I'm Boston Scientific, you know what? I'm gonna focus on arteries in the chest. So again, where am I gonna go commercially? What are the technologies I'm gonna use? How am I controlling these things? They're all connected, okay? And as I said, all this information is found in patents and they're all public. So 8,000 patents filed worldwide every day of the year. Okay, that's a tremendous amount of information that's sitting there available to technical people and to business people and to IP people and can be used in so many different ways. The other thing is 80% of the information found in patents isn't published anywhere else. So you can find scientific literature databases where some of the ideas might be published. Typically what universities do is the day before they publish a paper, an inventor comes up with a new idea and they publish a paper. The day before they do that, they file a patent. So the patent has been filed and then they publish a paper. But 80% of the time, the information that is published in that patent isn't published anywhere else. So you have this massive database, hundred couple hundred million documents growing by 8,000 a day, three and a half million a year, 80% of which isn't published anywhere else. Okay, so how do companies do this stuff without looking at patents? And let me tell you, a lot of them do. And what we call this is driving blind, okay? People are just going at it and saying, don't, well, we're not gonna worry about that. It's too much work, okay? And so you hear people like Elon Musk talking about, oh, we don't care about patents. and We'll let everyone use our patents and they're just landmines and blah, blah, blah. That may be true, but I can tell you they're looking at these databases. They're looking at this information. They're making decisions based on it. Whether they're filing patents or not is a separate issue, but they want to know what other people are doing. Okay. So super I'm, quick question, Professor. Yeah, please go ahead. Is that farming data from multiple countries or just the United States? Yeah, so this is family data. If you remember from the very beginning, I kind of highlighted this, and that's a great question. So we are looking at 41 unique families and a record set, one publication per family. But if you notice, like on this slide, um, you can see that there are many more patents than the 4,000 because they're representing, like there's 480 in the U.S., 279 in Europe, uh, 365 in the PCT, 250 in Japan, this is just Boston Scientific. So yeah, they, some of, they're just showing one publication and all the other charts, but in this one, you're looking at the jurisdictions where they're, where they're actually trying to get coverage, okay? Okay. So, yep, so just quickly, um, we're coming to the end and I wanna leave it open for some questions. IP is a control position and this is where it kind of gets interesting and things start to connect, right? This takes a little bit of time to absorb, I know I'm exposing you to new ideas and new things that maybe you're not familiar with. That's part of going to grad school, okay? The leadership part is super important, maybe the most important piece, but getting this full perspective, getting this very kind of balanced view, this holistic view, I believe is also very important. Um, so as a control position, I just wanna put this out there, and this is just a quick review. So 
intellectual property rights are rights that prevent others from doing something. They are not something to give you the right to do anything. So if you get a patent issued on your new idea, it doesn't give you the right to do that patent. It gives you the right to stop other people from doing what's disclosed in that patent. Okay, and if you're talking about proprietary knowledge that has value, um, that, that has economic value that other people wouldn't be able to figure out, that would be a trade secret. And if you're talking about making, using, or selling proprietary technology that you're gonna publish, that would be a patent. And I just wanna leave it there, okay? This is just a demo course. I'm just trying to expose you to some of the concepts. I know I'm going a little bit deep, um, but hopefully I'm inspiring you to think a little bit outside of what you know and trying to keep you um, sort of do it in a way that you can understand what I'm talking about. And then also giving you a platform to ask questions and to discuss with the group. So I do a lot of grouping where I pair you off with other people and you work together and we work together to try and solve these problems. I don't want people walking away saying, I have no idea what this person is talking about and how it's useful to me. Okay, so I, on that, I wanna see if anybody has any questions or feedback or anything you wanna know about me, about the Fung Institute that I can answer, about the lesson I just gave you or anything at all. I'm here and ready to go. How heavy into data science does this go? Uh, so the potential to do data science based on what I showed you with like digging into patents can go quite deep. Um, and it does. Um, but in the course that I'm teaching, it's a basic, you know, I'm trying to introduce you to the concepts and get you thinking about it. But if you're a data scientist, um, then yeah, I would encourage you to go very deep. And there are people and organizations that are, particularly with some of these new um, large language models, to figure out how to query patent databases. There's been historical work on machine learning work on term frequency, inverted document frequency algorithms and self-organizing maps to try and sort of figure out ways that all this information connects because there's a ton of data. It's a huge corpus. And some of the earliest big data projects back in the early 90s were based on patent information because it was structured data, lots of it, and across many, many different technology areas and public. So it made it an easy corpus. Go ahead, Andres. Well, the question was a bit similar to what John said, but a bit wider. Uh, are we going to go deeper in this concept that you just exposed, I guess, in, in further classes? Absolutely. So that's the idea. So during my tech strategy course, just to give you an idea, I select a technology um, that's publicly available from a university and I team you up with three or four other people and you work. I give you lessons. Um, it's a two hour class, I believe. And so for the first hour, or hour and 20 minutes, I give you a lesson and then I have you work in a team um, to work on how do we commercialize this? How do we take this information we're learning and put it into a 10 page slide deck that we could present to show whether this is a, you know, a licensable technology, a startup opportunity or something else. And so I focus on the business piece. How are we going to commercialize it? Focus on the technology piece. How is it unique and different from what everyone else is doing? And I focus on the IP piece. How do we control it? And then you work together most of the time as you're working on teams to come up with a strategy and sell the class at me on how you're going to take it forward. Go ahead, Alana. So I've, I've heard for these leadership courses um, within the program, multiple times they've been referred to as boot camps. How does that differ from a class and are they the same? Yeah, great question. So at the beginning of um, the year in August, you would have like a 10 day boot camp. There's only a few that are offered. And you are, it's like an hour and a half or a two hour class. And, you know, you're like going in hard, right? You got to learn all these new concepts. And every day there's lots of reading and lots of work. And then you're having class discussions. And we're trying to instill in you the idea of like communication is really critical for the class I teach. There's teaming classes, there's marketing classes, there's all kinds of boot camps. And those just happen before the semester starts. And those get you ready for what's going to happen during the <laughs> semester, which is you're going to have, you know, three or four courses. And those are like meeting every week, like you're probably used to in your undergrad, all the way through the first semester, you do your finals and your presentations. And then you have your second semester starting in January. But before that starts, there's a boot camp. 
again, another 10 day, eight day process where you kind of get reoriented and you're starting over again. And then the one thing that goes throughout the whole year is a capstone project, which is a project where you work with other people on a real world solution. And most of the things I focus on and the boot camps are kind of focused on pushing you towards real world things. There's a little bit of theoretical issues. It's all about how do we do this in the real world? Because the whole idea of being a leader and teaming and getting to know your colleagues and building a network, which I really focus on as well, I want you all to get to know each other because you're going to come out of this program. You're going to have this amazing master's of engineering education and all these great new concepts you've learned. And then you're going to be looking for work. And it's the people that you see in this room. I see somebody said, hey, I'd like to connect with you guys on LinkedIn. Please do that. Okay. Go into the chat and connect with this person. It looks like it's from Yu Feng. Uh, Yu Feng, sorry. Um, you want to you wanna try and connect with as many people as possible because these are the people you're going to be working with over the rest of your lives, okay, in one way or another. Or you're like, hey, I'm doing a nonprofit. I know um, John is was working in nonprofits. Let me talk to John. Or John says, I'm going to go into commercialization of this new product at uh, Tesla. And Ivan is an engineer at Tesla. Like, you just don't know how these things are going to work out. So part of the goal is to get to know as many of the students as possible. Okay, I see, do we get credit for bootcamp tool? Let's see, sorry. Uh, yes, I, uh, Haiti, thank you. Yes, you do get credit. Um, let's see. Okay, and you sent a link, thank you. Anybody else have a question? Thank you uh, so much, Haiti. Yeah, go ahead. Question. Um, do you have a capstone project focused on something like IP mapping? So I don't, but um, Professor Fleming, I think it's L Fleming with one M at berkeley.edu. Um, he offers a, uh, a class in um, a capstone on that topic. So feel free to email me. Um, I'll put my email in the chat um, and I'll, I'll set you up with him. Um, and like I said, feel free to reach out on LinkedIn as well. Go ahead, Ivan. Professor, uh, when when is your class? Is it the first boot camp or is it the full spring? Yeah, so I teach a fall boot camp called um, 270B, and then my this which is tech ethics, tech and R and D ethics, um, and there's several other teachers that teach that course, same course, and the the professors are amazing. Um, I work closely with them, and they're all great. They all bring different perspectives to the same case studies. So if you've never done a case study, you read a long reading, and then we discuss it in class. Um, and then in the winter boot camp, I teach Tech 270i, which is this um, um, technology strategy at the convergence of business technology and IP. And then during the year, I am involved with Tech 273 and 274, which are or Engine 273 and Engine 274, which are the commercialization projects with Lawrence Berkeley National Labs. And that one, John, is where you would get access to the capstone. It's focused on this. All right, anyone else? Uh, I have a question about uh, commercial with like IP generation uh, yeah. for small businesses is like, what's the best methods with it? Because I know as I know you can, I know there's some weird uh, legal stuff with ownership with SB, STIR, STTIRs and SBIRs. Mm -hmm. How would you recommend with like, uh, or what's your opinion? What's your What's with IP with like protection with those? Yeah, so it's complicated because you have agreements. And if you go to Berkeley, um, you're going to sign an IP agreement with the university. That, um, I'm not, I haven't read it recently, but there's provisions in there about what happens if you invent technology while you're at Berkeley. Who owns it, right? And those ownership issues are also things that come up in the classes and SBIR grants. And as John was talking about, you know, government funded things or where government is spending money or taxpayer money to develop new technology who owns that those are the control issues other control issues that we'll get into so i don't have a really good answer for you william feel free to email me if you have a specific question about it like if you have a specific case but i think the main thing is that you want to make sure that you are um, exploring these questions before you start developing new technology and understanding what the ramifications of you developing technology while you're at the university 
who owns that and whether or not you have um, access to it and how you have access to it and what the process is. So sometimes I think the technology transfer group at the university will say, yeah, we're not interested in that, go ahead and take it on your own. Or they may say, no, we own part of that. We wanna file a patent on it. I don't know what the provisions are for MN students. And so I don't wanna to speak to that, but there's certainly gonna be language that you would have to sign. And so you should read it. And um, if you're concerned or whatever, then I would um, suggest you talk to an attorney. It's always good to know attorneys. So when you're at Berkeley, I should go out and meet people at the law school, okay? Meet some of those law students who are going through the same process you are, because throughout your careers, whatever you do, start up, big company, consultant. Anybody else? Thank you, William, that was a good question. Yes, that's a great question. I almost feel like boot camp could have a lawyer to guide us because we're all innovators. Probably. Yep. So there's a guy by the name of Cal Gonzalez who teaches a great boot camp. He's an attorney. Um, he teaches, I can't remember what the number is. It's in the winter boot camp, but he does dive deep into ethics and he's a great guy. Yes. Some of those topics. Um, yes, thank you so much, Haiti. You're amazing. <laughs> Can do it without you. <laughs> no worries. There's actually, he's actually going to do a course preview um, this okay. Friday. If anyone is interested in attending that, it's on the new admin website under the events. Okay, this is going to be on Friday from 12 to 1. So if y'all want to, you know, Great. hear from the other perspective as well. I highly recommend it. Cal is amazing. He's a great communicator. He's a great leader. He's been a very successful lawyer at a big investment bank for many years, so he's a good resource. Um, do you wanna add anything else, Haiti? I didn't even introduce you, but maybe you can say hello to everybody that's left. Sorry about no, that. No worries at all, Matthew. I got, to, Matt, I got to meet some of y'all on Tuesday morning during the kickoff, so it's nice to see some of y'all familiar with um, on the emails in the inbox too, so <laughs> thank y'all for joining. I'm really glad that y'all are able to hear from Matt and I'm also excited to be here this is the first time also previewing a course preview myself so yeah it's I'm, exciting can... even though I'm not a student you know yeah yeah well I will give a shout out the Fung uh, Institute staff is honestly some of the best people they're super um, in touch with the students they're very available they cover all different aspects of um, questions from you know where am I going to get a job or how am I going to find employment to you know um, mental health issues or questions about whatever it is, they're 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 great. Beth and her team do an amazing job. And um, so that's another benefit of being involved with the Fung Institute. Their admin team is really amazing. So lean on them. If you decide to move forward with this, I would highly recommend that you lean on that staff and lean on the professors and take advantage of any opportunities you can because there's all these overlays. I went to an event the other day that Elisa, uh, Alicia Mandak put together, that she's part of the Fung Institute on the job side, helping people find employment. Um, she did a project with uh, Skydeck, which is an incubator at UC Berkeley. And there was a conference and engineers were there and some of the startups were there. And there was just a great uh, opportunity for people to interact and meet different people within the larger UC ecosystem. All right. Thank you all so much. I look forward to meeting you all in the fall or in the winter or both. And feel free to reach out if you have questions. Thanks so much for your time. Have a great rest of your morning, afternoon, or evening. <laughs>